Hi, I'm Matt Holland. I'm a grad student at George Fox Evangelical Seminary, and today I get to teach you a little bit about Irenaeus of Leon. Irenaeus was born in the year 120 in the city of Smyrna. Smyrna is in modern-day Turkey, the west coast of the country on the Aegean Sea. Irenaeus was born in a Christian home, in a Christian family, and from an early age studied under the bishop of Smyrna, uh, Polycarp. Polycarp was John's disciple. So Jesus, John, Polycarp, Irenaeus. Very close to our earliest Christian writers that we know of. Uh, Irenaeus demonstrated himself to be an incredibly knowledgeable theologian and one that worked well in multiple cultures. And so the church in Smyrna decided to send him to Gaul, which is modern day France, uh, in particular to the city of Lyon uh, around the 150s. And Irenaeus was sent there to help East Asian or Asia Minor Christians to find a home and acclimate to the culture of Gaul. So Irenaeus and in Asia Minor spoke Greek and grew up thinking very much in Eastern Christian terms and was coming to the Western side of the empire to help Eastern Christians who had immigrated there to find a home, to feel welcome, to make sense of the world that they were in. Irenaeus, once he got to Gaul, once he got to Leon, really felt it was his role to help these Christians to understand what the truth was. He felt like there were other groups around that time that were teaching false doctrines, teaching heresy that he didn't believe was true. And so from very early on, Irenaeus became a proponent of true thinking, of right thinking, of orthodoxy. Uh, in the year 177, Irenaeus went to Rome and he was talking with the Pope then, or just the Bishop of Rome, as it was earlier than the papacy was really solidified, talking with the Bishop of Rome about heresies that were that were making their way into Gaul that he felt were originating there and felt it was Rome's job to uh, to stomp out those heresies so that they did not lead Irenaeus uh, and his brothers and sisters in Leon astray. While Irenaeus was in Rome in 177, the emperor of the Roman Empire, Marcus Aurelius, called for a persecution of Christians in and around Leon. And while Irenaeus was gone, Bishop Pothinius of Leon was martyred as were about 15 other Christians in that city. Uh, when Irenaeus came back, he was elected the new bishop to take over for Pothinius. And from there, really made it his job to shepherd his flock, to care for those around him, and to protect them from bad theology by directly fighting against that theology. The main um, theology that Irenaeus was writing against was a form of Gnosticism. Gnosticism is the belief that a special knowledge, gnosis is the Greek for knowledge, which is where Gnosticism comes from, that a special knowledge can save you beyond just who you know or what you profess or whatever it might be. So Valentinian Gnosticism, which is the main form, is what I want to talk to you about next. Valentinus was a Christian in Rome in the 130s and, and a philosopher and as he was thinking through philosophy, primarily through the philosophy of Plato and the Neoplatonists, uh, he, he came up with a new form of Christianity. And as this grew in popularity, as he started preaching it in churches, uh, it became clear that it was not the Roman Christianity. It was not the Christianity of Jesus. And, and by his own choosing, he actually left the church and started his own congregation. Uh, this became known as Valentinian Gnosticism. It it had its own gospel, which was called the Gospel of Truth. You can actually find it on iBooks for like a dollar. So if you want to read some interesting stuff, there you go. Uh, Valentinianism, uh, as it came to be known, spread all over the empire pretty quickly. And when it ended up in Gaul, Irenaeus heard it and thought, this is not right. This is not what Jesus taught. This is not what Jesus taught John, who taught Polycarp, who taught me. Um, and this is leading people astray. It really operated under the belief that there was secret knowledge that when you understood it, you would be able to escape the creation um, and enter into the spirit world. Platonism as a whole is a dualistic ideology um, that spirit is good and matter is bad. Uh, 
I have Valentinian Gnosticism is is really really complex honestly and pretty monotonous to walk through considering I only have half an hour of your time we're gonna more or less ignore it um but more to say simply it was the Old Testament God versus the New Testament God the Old Testament God was broken and and not powerful Yahweh was an evil imposter and so Jesus came in in the New Testament to defeat the Old Testament God uh, and to free people from this created world that Yahweh had made. So if we chose to understand the secret knowledge that Valentinus had, that the Gospel of Truth told us about, then we would be able to go forward and escape um, creation, become spirit, and be free from sin. So Valentinian Gnosticism was really different than Orthodox Christianity, and Irenaeus saw it as a massive threat. Um, it's almost impossible to understand Irenaeus' theology without first kind of understanding that, which is why we spend any time on it at all, to really get a grip on why he was writing that, that you kind of need to read some of that. So hopefully that is a little bit of a framer of what that looks like. Uh, from here, we'll kind of start talking about what Irenaeus really believed, what he wrote about. He wrote about all of this um, in a number of books, but primarily in the five book series called Against Heresies. Against Heresies is awesome. It is a profound writing and probably one of the earliest semi-complex theology, theological writings we have uh, in Christendom. It was written in the 160s, 170s, 180s um, in that period and shaped Christendom from then on. Scholars have said that Irenaeus did theology and the rest of the church has been commentary on it. He's primarily followed in Eastern Orthodoxy and so we don't hear about him too much in the West, but his influence on us and especially on the East can't really be understated. So let's step back and kind of look at what it is that he thought and believed so that we'll better understand what Orthodoxy uh, may be about. Irenaeus' understanding of sin is fascinating. It's actually really different than the view of sin we have in the West, um, in Protestantism and in Catholicism. And so I want to spend a little bit of time on it. It's, it's beautiful and it's really similar to what they teach in Eastern Orthodoxy. So, so bear with me a few minutes and we're going to talk a little bit about some really interesting aspects and ways of looking at sin. Irenaeus believed... Um, whether literally or in the Pauline sense, that humanity was created, Adam and Eve were created as infants. So somehow in some way, whether literally as babies or as adults that had, had infant minds, that minds had yet to mature. Like Paul says, when you first become a Christian, you, create, you crave milk. And then as you grow up, as you mature, you create solid food. Um, that in some way, Adam and Eve were not fully matured when they were created. And Irenaeus would say that then the role of Adam and Eve as, as created people was to mature. Uh, once they matured, he believed they would be given the tree of knowledge of good and evil uh, and the tree of life. And in their maturity, be able to handle those responsibilities, handle what it is that they were given um, and the abilities that that would bestow upon them. So for Irenaeus, Adam and Eve chose impatience. Rather than waiting until they were ready, until the fruit could be given to them, they took the fruit from the tree before they were ready. Um, the power corrupted them, basically, because they were not able, they were not strong enough to use it well. Uh, and so, in that, Adam and Eve loses their humanity. Jeff Vogel, who's an Irenaeus scholar uh, on the East Coast, writes this, According to Irenaeus, the fall is a mistake about means more than ends. Though God has always intended to give human beings a share in divine nature, it is necessary for them to become accustomed to bearing it over time. Instead, they forfeit this opportunity by trying to become gods too quickly. They try to take what they can only be given, to grasp what can only be graciously bestowed on them. In other words, in their effort to take the divine life early, human beings render themselves unfit for participation in it. Because the divine life is essentially only receivable, it proves elusive to all clutching, clinging, clasping. 
So humanity loses their potential. They lost that which they did not actually possess, in the word of M.C. Steenberg, who is a Eastern Orthodox scholar. Uh, humanity gave up their ability to be fully whole, to be fully human, to be complete by choosing impatience. So, so whereas I think in the West, a lot of times we view sin as pride, that we choose to be God in place of God's role in our lives, um, the East, and especially in Irenaeus' world, uh, viewed sin as impatience, that we chose to take that which had not yet been given to us uh, because we were unwilling to wait for it. Uh, within this, there's very much the reality that the devil is a liar, that Satan um, is nothing more than a deceiver, which fits a lot with our understandings of Scripture. Uh, against heresies, um, in Book 5, Irenaeus writes, The devil can only deceive and lead astray the mind of man into disobeying, disobeying the commandments of God and gradually to darken the hearts of those who would endeavor to serve him. So for Irenaeus, um, the role of the devil has always been and always will be to deceive, to lie, to trick, um, to get us to fall for our impatience. Uh, and in humanity, only in a humanity, we gave up what we had. And so we can no longer grasp that on our own. We've broken our nature so that our nature can no longer choose right, but will only choose wrong. Um, so it's not original sin in the way that Augustine thought of it. But it, it's very much an early modern, um, an early precursor to that idea. What's really fascinating then is how Irenaeus views salvation and what Jesus's role in is in it, um, and what Jesus plays in that. So, so next we're going to look at um, Irenaeus's theory of recapitulation. So the name we give to Irenaeus' understanding of salvation, his theory is called the theory of recapitulation. Uh, recapitulation is, comes from the Latin word re recapitulatus, which makes sense, uh, which actually comes from the Greek word anakaphaleo. Uh, anakaphaleo means to sum up, to combine, to gather together, to unite. Uh, he, Irenaeus actually pulls the word from Paul's letter to the Ephesians in chapter 1, verses 8 through 10. Uh, Paul writes, With all wisdom and insight, he has made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure that he set forth in Christ, as a plan for the fullness of time to gather up all things in him, that is to recapitulate all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. So, this idea is that Christ comes and Christ's role is to enter into creation and reunite creation uh, from its fallen state with, with God the Creator, uh, God the Father, in a way that it will then share in that reality. So, Ivor Davidson says it this way, which I think sums it up really well. By living a perfect human life and triumphing at every stage over the power of evil, Jesus avoided the areas of the first Adam, reversed their ultimate effects, and restored humanity to its original glory and fellowship with God. The final consequence of this participation in the human condition is that human beings come by grace to participate in the divine nature. So to say that uh, more simply, to say that kind of in a way maybe that will make sense to all of us, that Christ comes as the second Adam, that Jesus says yes in every aspect that Adam said no. And, and this all starts to come into play when you think if Adam and Eve were impatient to experience uh, what they had created to be, Jesus lived um, patiently through all of his ages. Uh, Irenaeus is really interesting. He says that, that Jesus lived to be um, into old age. Within, which in um, Greek thought uh, would be at least in his 40s, which is fascinating to think about within a hundred years of Jesus, Irenaeus seems to at least disagree with us about when, when Jesus died, how old he was when he died. So he very much believes that Jesus lived into infancy and as a baby said yes, where Adam said no as a baby. Uh, that he chose and patiently waited, and as an infant redeemed infancy, and then as a teenager or a child redeemed childhood, as a teenager uh, redeemed teenage years, as an adult redeemed adulthood, 
and, and as an old man redeemed old age. That for Irenaeus, Jesus enters into every aspect of life in choosing yes, in choosing yes to what God created us to be, is redeeming every aspect of that. So in pain, Jesus redeems pain. In death, Jesus redeems death. In life, Jesus redeems life. Uh, Irenaeus holds on to this view that, that Christ fills the whole of creation and pulls that back to us. So as just at Adam at the core, we break off. At Christ in our core, we then rejoin the line um, that we are created to live into. Jesus lives our patience for us, and then we choose to live into patience for Christ. Um, again, Irenaeus saw this as a victory over Satan, um, a victory over death, that when Jesus says yes, where Adam said no, Satan loses his power, that Satan loses his control. Um, Irenaeus says it like this in book three, therefore, as I have already said, he caused human nature to cleave to and to become one with God. For unless humans had overcome the enemy of humans and the enemy would not have been legitimately vanquished. And again, unless it had been God who had freely given salvation, we could never have possessed it securely. And unless humanity had been joined to God, he could never have become a partaker of incorruptibility. For it was incumbent upon the mediator between God and humans, by his relationship to both, to bring both to friendship and concord, to present humanity to God while he revealed God to humanity, for in what we could have, we be partaken of the adoption of children. Unless we had received from him through the Son that fellowship which refers to himself, unless his word, having been made flesh, had entered into communion with us. Wherefore also he passed through every stage of life, restoring all communion with God. So in Jesus, uh, in his patience, he redeems all of humanity and he creates this second lineage so prior to Christ, we live under the line of Adam. And after Christ, if we so choose, we live into the line of Christ. The new humanity, the restored humanity, the recapitulated humanity, the humanity that has been retied to the creator. So if we imagine sin as something that rips us away from God, Jesus recapitulates us, stitching us back together um, with the divine God with the creator of the universe uh, and with the divine order as a whole. For Irenaeus, within this view, um, within recapitulation, love is tantamount. Uh, love is the ultimate thing that Christ proclaims into the life of creation and into humanity. Um, Eric Osborne, another Irenaeus scholar, says it this way, because Christ is true man and true God, he sums up and renews humanity. This he does on the cross when he forgives his enemies out of infinite love. This is the keystone of recapitulation. The cross has to be true and without pretense of any kind. Goodness and truth are joined, else the love of the cross could not be effective in continuing the life of the martyrs and other Christians. On the cross, God became man and man becomes God if he displays divine forgiveness in the union of God and man, man is brought to life. And this gets at the result of recapitulation, which is called the deification of humanity. Uh, and we're going to spend a little bit of time on that because it feels really different from a lot of what we've grown up with in, in the West. All right, deification um, is, is massively important to Eastern Orthodoxy. It's massively important to understanding salvation. Probably the closest idea we have to it in the West is Wesleyan holiness movements um, and, and all that comes out of that, the Methodists and, and other holiness denominations that you have hopefully learned about at some point in your time at Fox or will learn about in the future. Um, deification can totally be misunderstood as humans becoming gods. Uh, and, and we see this in, in offshoots of Christianity and in other religions around the world that humans actually become God and, and can take that place. That's not what deification is saying in an orthodox sense, not what Irenaeus is saying. Uh, Irenaeus pulls a lot of this idea and, and Eastern Orthodoxy as a whole from 2 Peter 1.4. Uh, Peter writes, 
Thus he has given us through these things his precious and very great promises, so that through them you may escape from the corruption that is in the world because of lust and may become participants of the divine nature. Irenaeus says it this way in Against Heresies 3. For it was for this end that the word of God was made man. And he who was the son of God became the son of man, that man might have been taken into the word, and receiving the adoption might become the son of God. It's not that uh, humans become gods and become something more than human in recapitulation and deification. It's that humanity was always divine, that there was always something unique about humanity, and we lost that divineness in the fall. And so it's not that we become something greater than human, it's that in recapitulation, in life under Christ, we actually become fully human for the first time. Deification is the opportunity to enter into a relationship with the Father and experience um, the way you were meant to live. So again, not to become gods, but be, to become holy in a real, true, non-fallen sense. Uh, Irenaeus believes that in every aspect of our life, as we be recapitulated, our broken nature is replaced with our, our divine nature, our fully human nature. So that if I had a, a, a growth on my thumb, they could remove that growth and grow fresh, new, healthy skin there. Um, sin is that growth that has placed itself all over our body and all over our nature. And recapitulation removes the growths and restores the flesh underneath into what it could have always been all along. Um, this is incredibly powerful when you start to step into and look at the role of the church. Uh, and the role of the church is just mind-bogglingly beautiful. For Irenaeus, he really believes that as you step into church, you are stepping into the new Eden. And this is a beautiful reality. And think... This is in the 160s, 170s. There weren't very many church buildings. So this is much more than stepping into a space. This is stepping into community and into relationships. That for Irenaeus, within the church, universal, capital C, the body of believers, the communion of saints, the, the cloud of witnesses, within that world, Eden can be experienced as it were before the fall. This is where... You hear these ideas in Acts 2.42 of they shared, there was no poor, there was no hungry, they devoted themselves to prayer and the apostles' teachings. Um, this is living into the new reality of Eden. Uh, and in Christ, in recapitulated reality, the church provides this, that you could actually live in the sinless world of the church. And in that sinless world, in that recapitulated reality, redeem and defeat sin in the rest of reality. Irenaeus held um, then the sacraments incredibly highly, mainly uh, the Eucharist, Holy Communion, and baptism. That Irenaeus viewed baptism as the first act of breaking the hold of sin and brokenness of your life and restoring it with the first act of becoming recapitulated to Christ. That that the water of baptism begins stitching your nature together with, with God. Uh, stitching your nature together with, with Christ and the role Christ has in your life. And, and he goes even further with communion that very much every time you take in an aspect of the bread and of the wine, that never leaves you. The holiness of that bread, the holiness of that wine stays in you forever and is... And when you pass out waste, that is, that is being passed out is actually the sin and the brokenness that has been replaced by communion. So every time you participate in communion, you become more human than you were before. Your nature is actually being fixed and healed and made more fully human than it could have been without communion. It's this incredible view that again, when looked at through Gnosticism, where a Gnostic believed you don't need anyone other than this special knowledge, Irenaeus is saying, no, 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 you need so much more than that. You need your brothers and sisters, because in this community, your nature is healed patiently and over time. 
that it's not something that happens in an instant. It's something that happens every day more and more than the day before. That eventually, given enough time, you will fully mature into the divine humanity that you were before the fall. Um, it's this beautiful world that I think is more hopeful in many ways than some of the ways that we view sin uh, in the West. Uh, he views the community of saints, the church as a whole, as the keepers of Orthodox faith. That for Irenaeus, um, your role after who you got your tradition from gives it merit. So, which is why we know so clearly that Irenaeus learned from Polycarp, because Irenaeus would say again and again, this is true because Polycarp told it to me, and John told it to Polycarp, and Jesus told it to John, and would say, you know, where does Valentinus get his ideas? He's made them up. They're from Plato, not Christ. And they're from Neoplatonists more than even Plato. So it's this world of, you are viewing it wrongly. Uh, Irenaeus says this about the church. For the church has been planted as a garden in this world, literally the new Eden. Therefore, says the Spirit of God, you may freely eat from every tree of the garden, that is, eat from every scripture of the Lord. Into his paradise, the word, into this paradise, the Lord has introduced those who obey his call, summing up himself in all things which are in heaven and which are in earth. Uh, but all the things in heaven are spiritual, and those in earth constitute the dispensation in human nature. These things, therefore, he recapitulated in himself by uniting man to the spirit and by causing the spirit to dwell in man. He is himself made the head of the spirit and gives the spirit to be the head of humanity, the church. For through him, the spirit, we see and hear and speak. The church, this community, these keepers of orthodoxy that have passed on tradition from one person to the next, are guided by the Spirit, are centered on the Spirit, are sewn together with Christ by the Spirit. Um, it's this incredible world where everything is made whole in the church. And so if there is brokenness in your community where the church is, the church is not fully doing its job yet. And given time, may may well do that. But but it's this patience and this active growing of the garden. So just like we say church planting today, where you're planting an organism, not building a building, those seeds are people. The church then were the seeds of the garden. And when that church grows, the garden grows larger. It has nothing to do with created, grown space or developed walls or a building that is built. It is this reality of these seeds of people spreading throughout the empire of, of bringing about God's world on earth. So maybe some of you are thinking, why does Irenaeus matter? If, if this is mostly Eastern Orthodox belief now and not Western, uh, what, why should we even care about this guy? Why should we care about what he's teaching? And, and I would say a couple things. One, we're in an age when, uh, Pope Francis and the Patriarch of Constantinople are talking um, and holding ecumenical meetings where the churches could be coming together uh, to reunifying, maybe not losing their distinctness, but but being one church again, hopefully down the road. Um, but without having this understanding of where one another are coming from, unity seems impossible. So firstly, I think it is incredibly important to understand Irenaeus so that we understand our Eastern Orthodox brothers uh, and sisters in America and across the world. Roger Olson says it this way, in the process of exposing Gnosticism, Irenaeus also developed a Christian doctrine of redemption that profoundly influenced the entire course and direction of Christian theology. Some Eastern Orthodox theologians aver that all of theology is but a series of footnotes on Irenaeus. I think the other reason Irenaeus matters is because recapitulation is an incredibly attractive way to understand the cross in a world that may not love some of the models that we've been told as we've grown up. Uh, working in youth ministry and working in ministries that go about the world um, trying to convert people to Christ, 
we've used models um, that I think often leave people unsatisfied. And I think uh, recapitulation offers an alternative view that is biblical, that is historical, that is ancient, that can explain Christ in a way that might seem fresh to those that have walked away from the church. Irenaeus also was just profoundly powerful in shaping theology for all of us. Irenaeus, in Against the Heresies, writes, um, writes kind of the first creed that we really have. And, and when you look at it against the Apostles' Creed or the Nicene Creed, I think it is just incredibly similar. Uh, and this is, you know, 200 years before the Nicene Creed was written, uh, 300 years before it was finalized. So think about what this man has done for theology and what it is that we understand the church to believe. Irenaeus says this, The church believes in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth and the sea and all things that are in them, and in one Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who became incarnate for our salvation, and in the Holy Spirit, who proclaimed through the prophets the dispensations of God, and the advents and the birth from a virgin, and the passion and the resurrection from the dead, and in the ascension into heaven in the flesh of the beloved Christ, Jesus our Lord, and his future manifestation manifestation from heaven in the glory of the Father to gather all things in one and to raise up anew all flesh of the whole human race in order that Christ Jesus our Lord and God and Savior and King according to the will of the invisible God every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth and that every tongue should confess to him and that he should execute just judgment towards all, that he may send spiritual wickedness and the angels who transgressed and became apostates together with the ungodly, the unrighteous and the wicked and the profane among men into everlasting fire, but may in the exercise of his grace confer immortality on the righteous and the holy and those who have kept his commandments and have persevered in his love, some from the beginning of their Christian course and others the date of their repentance and may surround them with everlasting glory. In short, Irenaeus has shaped what all of us believe in one way or another and coming to get to know a little bit more about what that means offers more perspectives on our faith, more angles on Jesus that we may not see that will round him out, that will make him feel more real to us today. I hope this was really helpful. Uh, I hope that this is exciting to you. I would super encourage you to uh, do some Google searches and Wikipedia and whatever else on Irenaeus. He's a fascinating guy. He is someone that has given us the faith that we have today in a way that few have. And he's someone that was so close to Christ in time that I think he, he deserves uh, a closer look than we've often given him in the West. Thanks so much. Hope all of you have a great day. I will see you around.